Thank you, Jamie. Good evening, everyone watching online and here in the room. Um, we have several new folks and new faces in the audience tonight. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I call the October 24th, 2022 school board meeting to order. It is 7 p.m. We're in room, conference room C of the Fisher Administration Building at 12121 West North Avenue. Ms. Summers, please call the roll. Ms. Mielfeld? Here. Ms. Fraley? Here. Mr. Meyer? Here. Dr. Jessa Banger? Here. Dr. Hoyt? Here. Mr. Phillips? Here. Ms. Willis? Here. Members of the Wauwatosa School Board value the input of students, parents, staff members, and community members. The board's regularly scheduled meetings provide an opportunity for opinions and concerns to be expressed publicly. The board values all comments and will respectfully consider this input in decision making. The board requests that individuals limit their comment on each item to three minutes. Following any comment, an individual board member may respond on the issue raised. However, it is not the intent of public comment portion of the agenda for the board to be entered into a debate with a member or members of the community. Because non-agenda items are not publicly posted in advance, no action will be taken on public comment regarding non-agenda items this evening. Um, for those of you who have not been here for public comment in the past, um, how this rolls is there's an opportunity to come up. Uh, you would introduce yourself, share your name, share your address, and you would have three minutes uh, at, for any non-agenda public comment. Uh, at this time, is there any public comment in the room this evening? Hi, board members. My name is Sunny Iwanski. I'm uncomfortable sharing my full address. I'm in the 2500 block of in East Tosa. Um, I think most of you know me, so I'm a Wauwatosa resident, and I wanted to start by thanking you, uh, staff who's here on a Monday evening, board members, Dr. Means, for taking the time to do this. Um, I think it's really important that we're moving forward with the business of the district. I think that it's important that we acknowledge that a lot of work has been done by a lot of community members, by a lot of faculty, by a lot of staff, and by a lot of administrators to get us here. I think it's really important to acknowledge that we have listened to the voice of the people of Wauwatosa and that we are serving the children of Wauwatosa. I come from a background in the sciences and business. I started my freshman year of college and there were people who had not been educated on basic biology who were intending to be biology majors. I had a friend who in her freshman year biology class passed out because she heard about an ectopic pregnancy for the very first time. There are people in our schools who need to understand the biology of their bodies and they need to receive a comprehensive human growth and development curriculum. So thank you for passing that. I'd also like to add from the perspective of my business education, that in the absence of information, people make information up. And children, students, they're not children, right? A young adults, <laughs> young, <laughs> hey, I am talking. This is not your time and this is not your space. Please be quiet. These students have the right to learn about information that they should not have to go onto the internet to learn. If they do not receive that information, they will find it in other ways. Am I right? All right. So let's teach our children what it is to be an inclusive, knowledge-based, fact-based community. And let's listen to the voice of the people of Wauwatosa. And thank you for the work you're doing. I know this is hard. This is obviously hard. You can hear it in my voice. I'm frustrated and I'm ready for us to move forward as a district. Thank you. Thank you. May I, may I comment as a point of procedure, please? I think it might be helpful. I, the, the, the chair is running the meeting. So if anyone is out of order, it is in the province and authority of the chair to speak to it. So if you're at the microphone and something happens you don't like, appeal to the chair okay. to rule on what's going on. Please don't get into it amongst yourselves here because Dr. Jessup Anger is overseeing and running this meeting. Please give that to him respectfully. Thank you. Am I good to go? Okay. I am here tonight as the founder. Excuse and me. Can you actually share your name, your address? 
you need, I am not comfortable with sharing my address. Can you share what town that you currently live in? Uh, I live in, I live here. Where is here? I live in Milwaukee. Are you a resident of Wauwatosa? I am not a resident of Wauwatosa, but I am a community member and I have many friends who have children here. So I just want to be, I'm speaking just to understand happy. that you are not a resident of Wauwatosa and you do not have children in the district. I do not have children in the district, but I have many friends who do that are concerned and I'm speaking on behalf of them as Under, well. Understood. Is that Thank okay? You. Sure. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Jamie Michelle. I am here tonight as the founder and president of Gays Against Groomers, a coalition of hundreds of thousands of gay people and allies who oppose the sexualization, indoctrination, sterilization, and mutilation of children being done in our name. And I'd like to help clear a few things up for people tonight. Drag queen shows and story hours are not kid friendly. They are child abuse. Indoctrinating students with radical gender ideology is not inclusive, as some say. It is child abuse. Encouraging young children to explore their genitalia and their gender identity is not progressive. It is child abuse. Medically transitioning children and turning them into sterilized, mutilated, lifelong big pharma patients with an endless list of complications is not care. It is child abuse. All of you here do not represent the LGBT community. We do. You do not speak for the LGBT community. We do. You know what you're doing is wrong and depraved, but you continue to do it anyways, with the material being shown and provided to children in your district. The day of reckoning is on its way, and when it arrives, and it will arrive soon, you should be ready to defend, defend why you allowed and ushered in this mass scale child abuse, the likes of which have never been seen in this country before. You who allow this are abusers and enablers. You are the enemy of parents and their children. And if you are okay with, with you what, 30 seconds, if you are okay with the material being taught in your schools to your students, you should never be allowed within 500 yards of a child ever again. Please remember our name, Gays Against Groomers, you're going to be seeing a lot more of us and our work is just getting started. Thank you. I'm polygenic. I'm with the parents. I live on Thank you. Um, is there, I, I, there's not a um, community comment uh, line for the strategic goal number uh, for today, the human resources. Will there be opportunity for com community comment on that? I believe that's just a report and we don't have community comment on reports. Okay. There will be an opportunity at the end of the meeting for community comment on anything on or off the agenda. Okay, perfect. I will make comment then. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good evening. My name is Marissa Darling. I live in East Town. I am a community member and I'm also a former school counselor. I am here tonight to echo some points of what my friend Jamie said and also share my relative expertise around the topic of uh, childhood sexuality, childhood uh, knowledge and development around the topics of sexuality and gender identity, and to urge you to reconsider what's happening in the school district with the adoption of the new sex ed curriculum in Wauwatosa. So Jamie put it pretty perfectly when she said that this is really ultimately about the sexualization of minors to their detriment, to the detriment of their minds, of their bodies, of their souls and of their spirits. There's no room in the school day to talk about they, them pronouns when kids can't read on grade level. There's no room in the school day to teach a kindergartner about gender expression and drag queens when they are still having accidents at school. There's no room in the school day to talk to high schoolers about anal sex when they are busy applying 
to college. The demented, the short-sighted, the absolutely just not evidence-based nature of the curriculum that has been adopted and that is going to be used across the district in Wauwatosa, we don't even know what the effects are going to be of this yet. We don't even know what the data is going to look like. We don't even know what is going to happen to the children that are being exposed to these ideas that have no basis in science, that have no basis in biological reality, that have no long-term data to back them up. And yet this is something that you want to do district wide starting in kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade is to teach children that they can be born in the wrong body and use that as a basis for some form of social emotional well-being learning i don't even know what it's supposed to accomplish all i know is that kids are born the way they're born and they should be accepted for the way they're born gender non-conforming students should be accepted for who they are instead of pigeonholed into a supposed gender identity because they're girls who like sports or they're girls who want to have short hair or they're girls who are gay thank you there my name is Kristen Bach I am a Wauwatosa resident and parent I have four children in Wauwatosa schools or recent graduates of Wauwatosa schools including my son Theo who is here tonight uh, as a student representative for the school board. So thank you for that super cool opportunity that you give to local kids. Um, I am speaking extemporaneously, please excuse stammering. Uh, my eldest child is a gay man. He has graduated from Washington Elementary and Longfellow Middle School and East High School. And he is a college student at UWM having the time of his life. He was a gay 10 year old and then he was a gay 12 year old, and then he was a gay 16 year old before he grew into a gay 20 year old. And despite the very best efforts of every educator who ever invested anything into my child, and there were countless educators who invested countless resources into my child, there are zero times he ever saw himself represented as a gay man at any time in the curriculum of any of his human class, human development classes. His sexuality was not present. His freedom of his gender expression was not present. His physical health was not present. His emotional health was not present. And that was not because no one cared about him. That was because they were using an outdated curriculum wherein gay people are absent or a rumor. And I would like to thank the school board. I would like to thank everyone who has invested dozens of hours of uh, research and meetings and community spirited volunteering to make it so that my Charlie gets to be the last kid who is a secret to his classmates, who is absent, who is a ghost in his own classrooms. I would also like to thank the school board for prioritizing the safety of children in using medically appropriate terminology in the curriculum, because as we all know, there's an enormous body of research in the social sciences regarding how knowing appropriate medical terminology for their body is protective against sexual assault in children starting at the preschool age and extending through adulthood. You aren't teaching kids what their body parts are. I'm not teaching kids what their body parts are. We're teaching them what they're called correctly so that predators recognize that they're an educated child and so that they can uh, represent themselves and have agency in their own choices. And I thank you for that. We'll go um, 
We'll see where we're at for the next two comments, and then we'll, I think, move into this meeting. I'll be quick, relatively. <clears throat> My name is Paul Bruno. Um, I live in Ravenswood. Uh, I've got two children in the school district. Uh, something the NHS in the UK just told doctors not to encourage young people to change their names and pronouns because most uh, children who think they're transgender are just going through a phase. It seems to be really important to the people on the board. Uh, we were giving no uh, warning basically as parents you know, over vacation. Um, we had two weeks to figure it out. And of the 13,000 people that you sent surveys to, 184 were counted. We don't know how many actually responded, um, but I, I think, you know, we're going a little fast here. Uh, countries in Europe are already turning back the clock on where we were going and having to take my kids out of some of these things, they're going to be ostracized. And that is the last thing I want my child to think that their dad's a homophobe or their dad hates transgender people. Um, Cause like, I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care what you want to call yourself. But teaching kids this young, I think it's inappropriate. And, you know, look at test grades. They're falling fast. And we're putting in a brand new science. Like, I want reading grades and math grades to come up before we start entering all this. And that's all I have to say. And I really hope, like, look at what the NHS said. Um, they're turning back the clock because they see the what's coming. Um, thank you for your time. Nicole Etter. I live in East Town, Wauwatosa. And honestly, I think all the attention that's been devoted to this topic is ludicrous. And the younger grades, this curriculum takes up 0 0.2 or 0.2, 0 0.3% of instructional time. I remember those actual stats from the school district. It's a drop in the bucket of our kids' education. I have no worries about the math and ELA time and science and everything else that my kids are getting during the school day. However, I think there are certain people from outside our community, a lot of them here tonight, and a few from within our community who are using this opportunity to fuel divisions and scapegoat our public school and vulnerable kids for their own political purposes. It needs to stop. Thank you for all you do. Thanks. I think we're going to shift into, we'll have public comment again at the end of the evening. So folks are welcome to stay, but we've got a lot of business to get to. We're going to roll through all that business uh, and we'll have public comment at the end of our evening um, as well. Okay. It's a fun evening. Um, we have three of our four student school board representatives with us this evening uh, who will be taking the oath. The fourth is my understanding coming back from a college visit. Um, so we'll we'll catch him up at our next meeting. Um, but thank you all for your applications to everyone else who applied uh, for using your voice to advocate for student perspectives on the board. Um, and I'm delighted that you're all joining us here this evening. Um, our school board cl clerk, Dr. Jenny Hoig, uh, will administer the oath of office to student representatives at this time. I would do them all three together and can probably do it either from your, a lot of times we'll have them stand and do it at the microphone. <laughs> like they go to the microphone or I go to the microphone? Both. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, we're going to repeat after me. I, and then say your name. I do. Having been appointed to the Office of Student Representative on the Wauwatosa School Board. Having been appointed to the Office of Student Representative on the Wauwatosa School Board. But have not yet entered upon the duties thereof. But have not yet entered on the duties thereof. Swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. Will faithfully discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability.
Thank you all and welcome. Um, the student school board representative position is something that the board uh, began to include about five years ago, four to five years ago, uh, and have really played, I think, an important role in being able to bring student voice. Um, Dr. Means and I will be setting up a time for onboarding when all six of us can get together. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about your roles and some of the goals that you might have for this year that you would like to bring before the board. So can get, again, congratulations and thank you. Uh, our next item, is the consent agenda. Uh, are there any items in the consent agenda which board members would like to remove? Oh, yeah. I skipped one. Um, the next is a report from the Education Foundation of Wauwatosa. Dr. Means. Uh, Ms. Costa from the EFW will be making a presentation to the board and community regarding the fine work of the foundation. We may hold on this item. We can table it. Can I have a motion to table this item? So moved. Second. Okay. We'll come back when she's able to join us later in the meeting. Uh, Call the roll. Please call the roll. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Uh, Dr. Joseph Binger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Mulefeld? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Next item up is the consent agenda. Are there any items in the consent agenda which board members would like to remove for separate discussion and action? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any board discussion on this item? Ms. Riley. Um, I just want to say that it is great to see that we are offering this to students. Um, this is the first time I've, you know, learned about it from a personal standpoint and have been very, very impressed by both the or WTC folks and the UWM folks and um, I just think it's fantastic that we offer kids this opportunity. Um, and though it costs us money, I'd like to make sure that we are making it, uh, making all of our students aware of it. Um, you know, I, I wasn't aware of it with my first kid. Um, and so, you know, by the time you get to your third child, you know a little bit more. Um, so I, in, in terms of equity and we're thinking about our strategic plan, I'd love to make sure that this is knowledge that we make available to all families um, so that everyone benefits equally. And for those watching uh, on TV or in the room, what Ms. Fraley is referring to is one of the things in the consent agenda is uh, all the different opportunities where uh, students at Tosa East and Tosa West are taking courses uh, for college credit. Uh, at a variety of different post-secondary institutions um, and all the different courses that are being taken and the budget approvals for that as part of our consent agenda tonight. So good thing to know is one of the things that we do provide is an opportunity uh, as appropriate to attend post-secondary institutions. Uh, and these could be uh, anywhere from WCTC, I think MATC is on the list, Mount Mary, UW-Milwaukee, Marquette, several others. Uh, so a really great opportunity for students still in high school. Uh, certainly lots of opportunities to get post-secondary credit. Uh, and this is another one of those. So thank you for that, really. Any other comments from the board? Seeing none, any community comment on the consent agenda? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ms. Mulefeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Joseph Anger? Yes. Dr. Hoig? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Uh, Dr. Joseph Anger, I see two hands raised, but I'm not sure if it's for public comment on this item. I just want to bring attention to that. Yeah, those hands I'm just lowering now, they've been, um, they've been raised since the initial public comment section. So if any guests now want to comment on the consent agenda, could you please raise your hand online? I see no hands raised. Yes. Thank you. And that item passes. Our next item up on the agenda is strategic goal number four, high quality staff. 
Uh, and this is a report, a human resources report. Ms. Salasavke, thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Uh, in this evening's report, you'll see a number of updates, both about um, positions that we have added in the organization um, based on our student needs, as we've understood them since the beginning of the year, um, as well as some challenges that, that we're experiencing. Um, I would first like to point out um, that uh, since um, uh, the report was prepared, um, we've hired approximately 7.0 teachers um, uh, to the positions that we've had, and we've hired about 6.0 um, support staff members. We are planning to host a career fair focusing specifically on support staff positions in the month of November. Um, and we're also excited um, that the Urban Learning Collaborative and Alternative Teacher Certification Program in the area that partners with Mount Mary uh, will be available um, for during the career fair to talk with individuals who are interested in teacher certification, um, but also just interested in going into educational positions, starting to build those um, teacher pipeline tools for our organization. Um, later this week, uh, Dr. Means and Mr. Brightman and I will be meeting with our, um, our Wauwatosa Education Association members in our second meet and confer meeting of the year. Um, we also have our first support staff meeting to meet and confer um, uh, meeting scheduled for the middle of November. And so far, there's been fairly good interest um, in attending those meetings. Um, and finally, uh, we have our first health and wellness committee meeting uh, scheduled for later in the month of November. And we've invited all of our staff members, um, especially those with diverse perspectives, diverse needs to come and learn about not only um, our benefit systems, um, as well as um, uh, how our health insurance program is running and to help us really uh, map out a strategic path for the future. Uh, one of the other um, uh, components I'd like to call your attention to this evening is that um, last month, um, our colleague Matthew Vanderkamp was recognized uh, for his work with an agency uh, entitled um, the Ability Center to offer open gym activities to our recreation department. Uh, he was the first and our rec department was the first to come and get involved with that organization, uh, which offers uh, opportunities for participants to engage in indoor and outdoor activities like wheelchair basketball, sitting volleyball, goalball and tennis. Um, and that program is growing in the area with some new sponsorships. So uh, keep up the good work, Matthew and the team in the recreation department. Um, as we're looking at activities for the coming month, um, I'm excited to share with you that um, we talked, I believe, uh, at the last or maybe two meetings ago about some Dean of Students positions that we would be adding to our secondary schools. Um, our first Dean was hired last week and she'll be starting at Whitman Middle School next Tuesday. Uh, we have some additional interviews tomorrow um, for our other middle school position. And next week, we'll be interviewing for our high school dean of students position under the leadership of our colleague and friend, um, Sir Luke Pinion. We're looking forward to those opportunities coming up. And that's my report for the evening. Thank you. Um, before I ask the board for any questions or comments, I just want to make a comment on the Ability Center. Uh, Damian Bachman is a, is, plays a major role with that organization, is a parent in the district, and is um, so much positive energy. Uh, it's just a jewel for our community. It's doing a lot of really phenomenal things in county parks, uh, in the city, and in, in the Milwaukee region. So uh, kudos to Matthew and the team for finding ways to in, in, engage and connect with them. And that's a really exciting news. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, questions and comments from the board? That's really so for the educational assistant comp um, do we have a sense of when that will be figured out and will there be the possibility for us to have a different comp model in my first second semester hiring uh, so i appreciate the question um in talking with dr means and with mr brightman um, we felt that the adjustment to those salaries was best held within the planning for our budget for next year which would not have it in time for the second semester and has there been any conversation about what we might be willing or able to do in the short term to to get folks in? Um, I know we're competing with other districts and and you know charter appropriate schools for those specific positions, and just don't know if there's any flex there for what we could offer that might be a little bit of a bump or a a one time you know signing bonus or something because it's you know you've heard me say this before. Yeah. Not not 
for our current folks, much mm -hmm. less to get new folks in. Yeah, um, we have offered signing bonuses um, when we held our summer career fair. That's certainly something we can look at. Um, one of the things that we're looking at as well are, again, just the comparisons um, to other local school districts and what that means. Um, I think, as you saw in the report, um, the way we structure compensation for our educational assistants is based on their training and specifically educational qualifications. I think that is very savvy in comparison to the market, but we still need to boost the bottom up. So I think there are are some things that we can maintain as well that will help us along the way. Um, but we want to make sure that we're, we're ready to go ahead and make that investment, not just in new hires, mm -hmm. um, but we can offer the same um, uh, compensation and the same um, gratitude for the work that's happening for our current staff members. And so that makes it a much larger budget figure. Yeah. I'm wondering, though, know, if perhaps instead of like a signing bonus, we do an in a retention incentive bonus. Mm -hmm. So they come on and they get an incentive bonus if they stay into mm -hmm. next year. Um, we have, I started working with that a little bit okay. and, and, and with an employment offer, um, adding the fact that we will be able to give you an increase of at least this much at the end of the year right. to come back Minimum next year. Of. Yeah. Knowing kind of what we're thinking mm -hmm. about in terms of adjustments to those hourly rates. Okay. And then final question, have we thought at all about, um, at least for the elementary roles, mm -hmm. I, I think it would be hard to do at the high school level or middle school level, looking specifically at targeting recent college grads, right? Um, I was a 21 year old teacher and it was very hard to teach 19 year olds who were two years younger, but mm -hmm. obviously, you know, I'm thinking about my oldest who was a teacher's assistant during summer school and was with in the elementary school and, you know, had a ton to offer. So I just, I keep hearing about folks that are, you know, doing the waitressing thing or whatnot, because they're trying to figure out, you know, what to do in real life. Mm -hmm. and, and these, could we go back to kids that we've had as summer school assistants or, you know, because that's basically the salary they were making as summer school assistants. I don't know. I just keep figuring like the kids are out there, but they might, they literally might be like 22, 23, 24 year olds. Yeah. Uh, we are, um, um, my team met today um, and they have been really thoughtful and um, and very uh, creative in terms of thinking about how to go ahead and get at recent graduates um, in uh, uh, Luke's division, um, people and family supports. Um, we have colleagues who have made connections with universities to help find um, students who are maybe on an education you. pathway. I, like, I want to be yeah. sure we're turning over every rock because I know of teachers who are saying they're yeah. desperate to have them. Every rock and yeah. And leave. And leave. Yes. 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 Great. Thank you. Of course. Appreciate all the work. Any other board comment or questions on the Senate? So for our new students, school board members, um, what we have is about once a month, uh, Ms. Elzaski, who oversees our human human resources. Um, comes and shares a report on a variety of different topics of kind of who we're hiring, what we're hiring for. Um, staff morale, um, ways that we can do to make sure that our staff are taken care of and supported to the greatest degree possible. So you'll see this on the agenda about once a month um, throughout the year. So that's it's kind of a normal report that we have. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Meyer, I'm going to ask you to help me out with this one. So we have tabled the Education Foundation of Wauwatosa item. I'm going to bring that back onto the agenda. On the table. Motion to pull from the table for consideration. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Please call the roll. Ms. Mealfield? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessa Binger? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yep. Ms. Willis? Yes. We are back uh, to an item for the Education Foundation of Wauwatosa. As, as our new president of the Education Foundation of Wauwatosa makes her way to um, the table, thank you, Mr. Brightman, for your flexibility. Ms. Jack, Jackie Cotton has been on the foundation board since 2016 and has recently assumed the role of president. Um, the Education Foundation of Wauwatosa, the EFW, has a rich history of supporting the school district and, and enhancing the opportunities available to students and teachers. And so, Ms. Costa, thank you so much for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks for having me. Do you know if the presentation's already downloaded? It is. Ms. Elizowski, do you mind helping me? Yeah. 
for while we're getting this set up, how I'm curious how many folks in the office there in the room tonight have been to either the any of the EFW events? A couple of them. If you haven't been, uh, it is just the black and white ball is, I think, in May this year. Uh, it's its new permanent uh, time, a fantastic time to connect with neighbors and folks in the community, uh, raising funds for a great uh, resource. And then uh, a really wonderful event that happened a couple weeks ago at the zoo um, that is another big fundraiser. But the EFW is a really great opportunity and place to engage uh, if you're interested in being a community volunteer. Uh, certainly PTAs and PTOs and EFW does some phenomenal stuff and we're going to get to hear about a lot of that really good stuff tonight so if you haven't been there do some soul searching uh, make sure that you've thought why you haven't been there and see if you can get yourself to, to buy a table and take some friends and make sure that you're engaging in raising funds for kids in Wauwatosa. How many people are committed to going to an EFW <laughs> event? I want to see all your hand. Everybody in the room should be, if you, if you care about kids, raise your hand and say, I commit to donating money to the EFW this year in Wauwatosa. Is everybody, is everybody, let's see your hands. Who's, I'm not seeing them. Know that this influences whether, what I'm hearing. Okay. Okay, so the, the great part about this presentation is that um, we're using it as a PDF instead of a PowerPoint, so we don't get to see all the fun stuff, but um, we'll just go with it. So, um, uh, can I just uh, jump in? If you could share your screen, Corey, could you maybe assist in sharing the screen so that we can see it online as well? Thank you. Has anybody rethought and recommitted <laughs> to donating money to the EFW? I'm just not, I'm confused why everyone's not raising their hand. <laughs> that, that decision's been made. We'll be coming back to that in three years, though. We're good okay. to go. We can see it online. Thank you, Jamie. All right, well, thanks again for having me. Um, my name is Jackie Costa, like Dr. Means um, noted, and I've been on the Education Foundation for a while now. Um, our purpose is to promote excellence, innovation, and opportunities in the district uh, by raising awareness and awarding money for uh, teacher grants and um, these grants are usually the main purpose is to enhance and enrich the learning experience for all students. Um, training is down or the space bar. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. So, uh, for 32 years now, we've been raising money and we have, have awarded more than a million dollars. And in 2020, we actually gifted the district 30,000 for Chromebooks to help, um, you know, during the hybrid needs. Last year in 2021, we funded our largest grant ever, which was $50,000 for this amazing technology. Um, it's a 3D table. It's one of the only high school in the state to have this kind of technology. It allows students to dissect all kinds of things um, right at their fingertips. Our, uh, the past seven years, you can see that this just is a little snapshot of um, how our grants have touched every student in the district at every school. Um, some of those, some of those um, grants here are um, just a little picture of some of the things that we've that we've been funding um, some of the names that you might recognize from last year's round of grants where we awarded $72,000 um, for eight grants. We funded a music lab at Tosa East. We funded $8,000 worth of graphing calculators for uh, high school students at Tosa West. And like I said, some of the names that you might recognize, Elizabeth Updike, um, Sarah Minsky, Heidi Hedgewood, Adam Stephan, all at Tosa West. Um, Lauren Rosnowski Hayden and Jay Reinke from Longfellow also got grants last year. And then from Tosa East, we had some awards to the amazing Ken Craig Griffey, who you might 
know, he's kind of famous now around town, <laughs> uh, Jennifer Lotto, Michael Hayden, and uh, Jeff Krupsack also got some grants last year. Our grant um, window is now open, so any educators can apply. Uh, so these, like, um, like the board president just said, these are some of the events that we run. Um, the EFW Stampede was rebranded this year, kind of as a comeback after COVID, after COVID hiatus, and the Black and White Gala uh, that's coming up in May, and um, tickets will be going on sale for that probably second quarter. Uh, we couldn't really do it without the help of our sponsors. So we have some of these terrific partners around the, around town who contributed to helping us, um, as well as some of the PTAs from um, PTAs, PTOs, PTSAs throughout the district. Um, let's see. Of course, I have to give a little shout out to our website. We just redid that. <laughs> And um, this was going to be a little one minute video, but um, I don't think it's going to play because it's a PDF, but it's available on um, our YouTube channel. So thank you for your time. And I can um, ask, answer any questions that you, that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, the EFW is a, a wonderful organization. And like you said, it really supports the schools and the teachers. Um, and if we didn't have you, we couldn't do all the wonderful things we're doing. Um, and, and some, you know, of course, very innovative things. Um, my question for you is the, um, the drop in, is it nominations for programs in the schools from last year to this year? or funding and, or maybe both. So you mean like, because we gave eight last year and 12 the year before? Well, I was just looking at the dot chart that you presented. Oh. And I was wondering if it was just the, the number of submissions from the different schools or? Yeah, it does have to do with the number of requests that we get. And we have a, a pretty um, intense rubric situate, um, in place. And so there's two tiers of um, criteria, and it has to pass through those two tiers. But it really has to do with the uh, applications that we receive, and then um, we have a funding formula based on the amount that we raise. Okay. Yeah. So I think you know for this really driving then you know the applications would be. But there's probably been, I don't know how to explain that, um, but there's probably been a lot of change too, maybe in some of the buildings. So just the process. Well, you know, we award grants to um, everything from $500 up to, well, that 50,000 was our highest. Mm -hmm. um, so the more requests that we get, um, the better. And I mean, we, we want to give away the money. Mm -hmm. That's why we raise it. You know, that's what we're all about. So, uh, yeah, I apply. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that it's not too cumbersome of a process. I mean, it doesn't seem like it is from past experience, but it seems it's gotten easier. Okay. Yeah. All right. Change the we change the the application process. Yeah. And maybe. And maybe we can just publicize it more in the different school buildings so you know that this is available again if there's a lot of uh change in the teams there maybe they're not aware um so thank you that's really um two things one i would call out to the student school board members if there are things that you think that the school needs like to approach a teacher and you know there could be a collaboration between a student club and a teacher in terms of like what the needs are. So this is something that I would encourage you to think about how you take back this information to your own teachers to say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could do this in physics or we could do this in, in something else? Because um, I think hearing from students about what they want to see in the classroom is, is really important. 
Um, and the second thing is I just want to call out the EFW and say thank you for the rebranding of the walk run role. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility. Um, and I think that um, it might seem like a little thing, but it, I think it says a lot. And even the visual itself um, is a great way to the community, great way to communicate to the community about what we're prioritizing. So thank you for doing that. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Mr. Meyer. I would just like to call it out again, the website, tosaefw.org. It is such a happy, helpful, sharing, communicative kind of website. It's just the, you can go there and see what you're all doing. And please, it's visit that website, tosaefw.org. Thanks. Thanks. I, can you share a little bit about, I've been following along, there's been great social media posts of members of the EFW going into schools, um, sharing information with teachers who've gotten grants uh, and kind of doing little surprise pop-in visits. Can you share a little bit about, about what that what that's doing, kind of the, some of the response you've been getting? It's, but it looks fun online. Yeah, well, um, you know, we have some shout outs to some of the gallery here who, who actually did some of those visits. Um, so every year we make our grant announcement in March and last year we, uh, delivered donuts to the schools where teachers got some grants. Then in front of the students this, this year, just last week, we surprised the teachers in front of their kids with little goodie bags and, um, they didn't know, they don't know we're coming. Of course, we organize it with the principal, but um, I guess that the fun thing is that then the students can realize, you know, that their teachers are pretty awesome people too, and that they have done this for them. And uh, I think we have maybe one more surprise visit to go. I can't tell you when that's gonna be. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we, um, we get our board members to go out to the school to do that usually every fall. Awesome. Thank you for that work. Any other comments or questions from the board? No, just a quick thank you for everything you do. It's such an important partnership in our community. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. I'll um, send a link to that video. It's just one minute. It kind of summarizes everything I said. Awesome. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks. Next up is strategic goal number six, operations. Uh, action to approve the 2022-23 original budget and tax levy. That's me. It is recommended that the school board approve the 2022-23 original budget and tax levy certification as presented in both the attached on pages four through six and will be presented by Mr. Brightman and I so move. Second. Ms. Fraley? Yes. No. We'll talk about it first. Not yet. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'm so used to your <laughs> Okay, thank you. I mean, a little help from Corey to share it on the screen. So I've talked a little bit to the board about the counterintuitive side of Wisconsin school finance, and we're more than a quarter of the way through our fiscal year, and this is the statutory budget adoption requirements, as well as certifying the tax levy or resources we need to fund this current school year. So that's just something that's odd about Wisconsin. I don't know of another state where it happens like this in kind of arrears. Um, so in a long-term legislative discussion, not for this next biennium, but it might be something interesting to talk about, something that's more proactively thinking to where you're setting a budget financially now for something that would happen next year from now or six months from now. So that's just something to kind of placehold kind of where we're at. Um, I did prepare a budget summary in a little bit different format than you've seen in the past. Um, so I'd like some feedback on this as we go forward too. Um, there's a budget booklet that was attached in board docs and it's about 20 pages long. Um, the front section is a summary of where we are with the current budget process. 
Um, I'm going to focus on the front end of the document, really pages through three through um, eight in, in the document. Uh, we'll start with the budget calendar. We've talked about the long-term or next year's budget planning calendar. This is the final snippet of the current year planning um, since I joined the district back in June. Um, and just again, to remind you, the yellow highlighted items are when the board takes action on a specific item within the budget. And you can see we're at the October 24th, the last step in this current planning process. And we'll be requesting the budget adoption by the board as well as the tax levy certification tonight. Um, statutorily, we need to have that passed by November 1st of each year and then forwarded to the, the, the clerks by November 10th. So that's really the next steps we do behind the scenes um, after tonight. Uh, pages four through six are where we present the budget in the minimum, or it's not the minimum, but the required format that the DPI has as far as a board adopting a budget. So it's in that format, but it's not the most friendly document to look at. So we provide this, and this is what we ask the board to adopt, but we provide some supplementary information and some other formats to the same information to make it a little bit clearer for the community and, and for the board to kind of process through. Um, one of the key things we're doing tonight is obviously the tax levy. So um, this would be on page eight of the attachment. It reflects what we call section one, and it's a tax levy summary. And I'll get back to this after I make a few other comments. Um, you recall the board passed a budget back at the end of June, and that we call that the preliminary budget, and that gives us really spending authority through this time until the board adopts this original budget. Uh, on the expense side of the budget, there's really no changes from what the board approved back in June. Um, there's a, a minor adjustment, um, upward adjustment in the expenses for the voucher program, but there's an um, equal offset on the revenue side and the revenue limit for the voucher costs as they um, um, are part of our, our budget as we adopt it for this year. Um, there was another key difference on the revenue side. Um, uh, look at the revenue side, uh, the state equalization aid. Um, last year, the aid was certified as $17.8 million. And we estimated back in June that the district would get about $20.8 million in equalization aid. The actual number there was down um, to about $19 million. So you see the increase to the tax levy to offset that reduction in state aid. And that's just the way that it plays. It's not truly a reduction. We, as well as every district in the state, had a tough time predicting where state aid would come in this year. And that's because of the way the shared costs are factored in statewide, the impact of the large inflow of ESSER funds and how they are spent different timing wise and different levels at different districts across the state, especially the MPS and the large urban districts, they really sway how that, that impacts the aid formula. So we did get a little bit less aid than we thought, which means the tax levy is up a little bit from what we thought, but it's still down from what you saw at this time last year. So we're at, at uh, $58.9 million this year and $57 million um, on the levy side, as you can see on the screen. Uh, the tax rate is what most people care about is what does this mean to my individual property taxes? And even though the tax levy is up slightly, um, the tax rate is down significantly. And that's because of a 19.32% increase to overall property valuations. We predicted about a 2%, very conservatively, a 2% back in June. And so that's much higher. So the tax rate impact is much greater than we anticipated back um, that, that five, six months ago. Um, if you're a person owning that average $300,000 home, uh, two years ago, your school property taxes were just over $2,500, and this year they're just over $2,000. So they've gone down. And yes, the home values have also gone up, so there's an equalizing factor there. But if the, the home value is fixed, that will be the impact um, on that average home. And then we put a couple charts in to kind of show the interplay of those taxes on that home, as well as the actual taxes and then the tax rate. So the one on the right, you can see that inverse relationship where you have the, the high increase to the property valuations. <laughs> So all the other funds, so the special education fund, the gift fund, the food, uh, food service, community service, they're all unchanged from what the board saw and approved back in June. So I won't spend any more time going through those. And so tonight we are asking the board to approve the 2022-23 original budget as presented on pages four through six of this attachment. Um, and then to certify the 2022-23 tax levy at the $58,955,626, which is shown on, on the attachments also. So to make it easier, you can say as presented if you like, or you can actually reference those pages in the document. Mr. Phillips, I'm gonna give you as board treasurer kind of the first, um, any questions or comments that you have about the, the budget and levy? Um, I think what the good news is, I mean, the new information for us is the levy. 
So um, I think that's a really good story for us to be able to to tell um, <clears throat> that there's some relief for uh, taxpayers this year. So as we, you know, the rest of the budget remains pretty much unchanged. So um, as you're talking to your, you know, to your neighbors and, and things like that, that would be a, a high point to share with them. Other board comments or questions? Any of them? I support the budget. So thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of work that goes into this, Mr. Brightman, and I have been asked about it multiple times over the last several weeks. Um, and, you know, we can point to we can point to this information and really share it with the community and how it will impact our learning and student, you know, on our programming and students. Schools? And just to give you feedback, I appreciate so much the calendar. I mean, even looking at the bottom of the page at the projected calendar that's under development, it's so helpful for me to visualize you know, what things are coming up on our calendar, what we'll be voting on, just so that, you know, I know what's coming up and I can do my own research and have a better understanding. So thank you for that. My only comment would be, I think Mr. Brightman, you started off talking about how complicated uh, school finance in Wisconsin is. Um, when I first started on the board about six years ago, five, six years ago, I remember there was a blue ribbon panel uh, that was right around that time, bipartisan, a lot of state legislators, a lot of ideas that folks agreed this would be good stuff to do for the state and for, for schools. Um, and if I recall, none of that moved forward. Um, so I, I say this to share, uh, Ms. Fraley and I are co-chairs of our Legislative Advocacy Committee. Uh, we will, we have begun and we will continue to make sure that we're advocating for resources for schools, Wauwatosa statewide, um, particularly for our kids and our families in our, in our community. Um, so um, I think the budget, uh, you all did a one, really wonderful job. We had two very uh, long conversations about this when the budget was first uh, shared with the board over the summer. Uh, thank you for bringing this back and for approval. Uh, and we've got work to do as a state uh, around funding issues. I know we've we've we're seeing some some long term drops um, in in terms of where we are putting money and resources. And uh, good news: five point five billion dollar rainy day. I believe on top of the rainy day fund um, that hopefully we can advocate um, for kids in schools. I know polling shows that there's a lot of support for uh, money, more money going to public education. So uh, hopefully we'll get there. Thank you. It's really um, Mr. Brightman, I'm wondering if for our student school board members, you can sort of articulate just in a couple sentences what you were talking about in the beginning about we're a quarter of the way through our business year and just in lay people's terms, because I think one of the things the Legislative Advocacy Committee has been talking about is how do we actually educate the public as to how this very complicated process works. And so I think for them, just super high level, if you can explain the timeline it might be helpful. Yeah, so I did put the last page in the attachment in board docs. Um, and we'll maybe have to get them Chromebooks so they can kind of follow along with what we're, we're looking at. Yep. Um, but it shows our full budget calendar that we plan into next year's budget. So the 23, 24 uh, budget plan. And there, um, there are really two key formulas we look at. The first one being the state aid formula. And you hear a lot about that one. Um, and that provides an equalization of the property tax impact across the state of funding schools by providing a, a, a bunch of state aid to some districts and little state aid to other districts. We've been in the little state aid side of things. Um, it's based on an index of spending and then property wealth per student. And so it just depends on you fit in that formula as to the amount of state aid that you get. Uh, the second one is the revenue limits itself, and that sets um, really a revenue limit, as it's called, on the combination of state aid and local tax levy that any one district can, can have in a given fiscal year. And it's not equal across the state. It's wherever you entered the system in 1993. That's another odd piece to the, the funding model. You're kind of stuck there as you move forward, unless you go through an operating referendum to, to change your position within that. Um, and then that formula gets adopted or updated on October 15th with our actual allocations of state aid that we just received that allocation. And then we update our tax levy and, and approve a tax levy tonight based on that allocation. So that's kind of the gist of those two key formulas and how they fit. And as you said on the board of student reps, you'll see the full budget cycle produce itself over the this next year and how everything kind of fits together at the end to get to this point as kind of the final step. Yeah. 
the key takeaway being that I want to make sure you understand is that we create our first budget without having any idea how much money it's going to be coming to us. And especially this year, <laughs> next June or July 1 is a state biennial budget. So every two years, the state passes a biennial budget that includes school funding. And we don't know what that means. So we're going to have to do our best estimates as we progress through that. We'll have a high, medium, low of kind of what we're predicting funding might be at and plan accordingly with that. And we won't know until close to July 1 when we start our fiscal year what the actual allocations are likely given the past history of how the legislative process works. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say thank you for the work you do. I really appreciate having the budgeting ability to be able to keep the schools running and First and foremost, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Also, your explanation was very nice. <laughs> Any community comment on this item? Hi, my name is Alicia Bartz. I live at 1421 North 69th Street in Tosa. I don't know if this is appropriate, but I'll just mention that I'm curious where donations are counted for in the budget so you know what the actual costs of things are. Some of our booster clubs and sports teams are very, very good at fundraising. And so as a parent, I find myself handing money to many of these clubs. And I think if certain parents retire or certain booster clubs go away, you'll have a lot more dollars hitting the budget. So I just don't know if there's a place where you keep track of in-kind gifts or donations. So you have a sense of those real dollars that maybe aren't coming out of the budget. And you may do that somewhere else, but I just wanna mention it because I, I do sometimes wonder if we're we're accounting for the full picture of what it costs to run our fantastic theater programs, our band programs, our sports when there's money coming in from these different ways. Thank you. It's a great question. And I can provide a, a pretty quick answer to it if you're okay with that. That'd be great. Um, we do have general fund, which are general operations funding for those programs that were mentioned. Um, but any gifts that come in, whether it's through the foundation or the booster clubs, gets put in a separate fund. And so it's isolated for the purpose it was gifted to the district for. So we receive the funds, we buy what was intended for, and it washes to zero. So there is no net impact on the, the district budget with those items. But it is kept and held separately and accounted for separately within the budget process. And I think what, what Ms. Bartz was talking about was if we didn't have those generous donations, how much more would we need to fund those areas in order to provide just what we're providing now? Is that, I think that would be, and I don't even know if I've never, never seen anything on that. And so I think that's something that we can talk about. I think it's a good question because it, it basically comes to the, what is the full cost of doing and providing to kids what we're doing? It's good. Seeing no other community comment, anything online, Jamie? No, there are no hands raised. Okay. Please call the roll. Ms. Mulefeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? No. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. And that passes. Our next item is an action item to approve Compass Care for Medicaid. It is recommended that the school board approve recommendation of Compass Care to oversee the administration of Medicare reimbursement claims for the district. And I so move. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. I can give a quick summary of this item. Um, administration of both people services and the finance or business office are recommending Compass Care LLC as the district's federal Medicaid service agency. And that will be effective January 1st, 2023, but they'd have some gear up and some ramp up time prior to that if they are approved. Um, this recommendation comes down to past practice and experience with um, the new staff coming into the district and looking at our Medicaid uh, reimbursements received and thinking they're very low compared to what we would expect in a district our size. So we dug in a little bit and we found the prior provider um, wasn't as aggressive with the reporting and coordinating internally with the staff that we things we have to do to get that reimbursement. Um, and again, we've had very good success with this, um, with Compass Care in getting those reimbursements. Um, so we had a discussion with them and we're looking at the magnitude of several hundred thousand dollars a year of additional 
reimbursements for things that we already are entitled to be reimbursed for. So this isn't doing anything new as far as the system. It's just what we're claiming and how we're claiming that to increase revenue back to the system. Um, with that, you'll start to see those in increased revenues on our budget planning moving forward. It'll reduce any budget deficits we'll be talking about based on state budget parameters um, for the future. So we'll put a number around that as we bring back future budget discussion items. So you'll see that real time. Um, the current provider has been notified of a 60 day contractual termination um, with them. We've been with them for a number of years, well over a decade, could be a couple decades. Um, but we would like this new agreement to go into place as soon as possible again to allow for that transition. And the way this works is we submit quarterly um, staff pool lists that get generated and then validated and followed up on by this provider. And we want to do that for the January 1 quarter, so January through March, um, to get this moving and, and get those additional reimbursements moving. Um, so with that, we are recommending the board approve the Compass Care Agreement as presented. I'd just like to add as well, the um, Compass Care service is, is a higher level of service and a different level of service as well for our providers that are actually doing the billing and counting and tracking their minutes. So they provide a really great customer service as well, um, as well as tracking. And it's it's above and beyond, I would say, what our staff are typically used to in terms of the support around Medicaid billing. Thank you. Any board comment or questions on this item? Seeing none, any community comment on this item? Ms. Uh, Dr. Jess Vanga, we do have an online comment. Oh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, Deb Falk Palak. Um, hold on one second, sorry. Deb Falk Palak, you are now have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Uh, thank you. Hi, Deb Falk Palak, Wauwatosa resident. Um, I am just curious if this billing for Medicaid will still require the district to be sending notification to parents um, because the district staff don't always know, I don't think, um, which students may have Medicaid coverage as a primary or a secondary coverage. And I can tell you it has been several years since district staff have sent something. Um, so I don't know if this is primarily the fault of the provider or what was happening internally with our district staff to reach out to families to let them know that the district would like to um, bill Medicaid for those services. Um, and then also I would just really highly encourage that um, there's a strong look at confidentiality with sharing of information with this new provider with um, family names, et cetera. And lastly, um, Ms. Willis, I think when you made the motion, you had said Medicare instead of Medicaid. Um, so there's um, obviously a big difference on that, but there's just a technicality there, which could you know, be huge. So thank you. There are no more hands raised. Let's call the roll. Ms. Mielfeld. Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Joseph Anger? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Next up on this, I, next up is action to approve a construction manager for the Washington Playground Project. It is recommended that the school board approve recommendation of VJS to serve as the construction manager for the Washington Playground Project, and I so move. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Mefeld. Okay, I can give a quick summary in this item. Uh, the district has bid out the construction manager work for the Washington Playground work, um, again, planned for this spring and summer. Uh, the board did approve the actual project this last March, and so that's all good to go. Uh, we've done everything with the planning, design, permitting, all that is ready and set. Um, the next steps were to identify the construction manager, and then that firm will take everything out to bid and get, get everything in place for the project to actually happen. Um, there was some question as to whether the scope of this project still fit under the refer referendum definition. It's still a referendum funded project, but it kind of went beyond the duration of the scope of that work. So 
Um, we thought to be safe, we would rebid that out. We had four firms bid on it. We sent it to, I think it was eight and received four bids. Um, BGS did give the winning bid and they were the referendum uh, construction manager provider also. Um, and you can see a bid summary attached on board docs. Um, they had a summary in their total fees and general conditions of $110,000 compared to about $200,000 with the rest of the providers. Um, but then there was an offset on some of the self-perform work. The total bid came in at $410,000. The next highest was $438,000. And then the two bids from C and D did not bid on the self-perform work. So we identified the lowest of the two costs there to add to their totals to get an idea of what the total cost would be with their bids involved also. So again, it's a pretty straightforward project um, in scope compared to the other things that BGS managed for the referendum projects. Um, but we wanted to go through and bid this one just to be safe again with the uh, the purchasing and bidding requirements of this of the district. So we are recommending BGS for approval. Board members, I would just uh, say two things. One, I would like to thank Mr. Brightman and Ms. Chawinski, uh, Mr. Chawinski for their due diligence with this work. We promised the Washington School community that this past summer that we would make this a priority, uh, this project a priority. And so I'm glad and pleased that we're continuing to demonstrate that work. Um, I think your approval this evening will allow the construction manager to, to stay on a timeline and make this, this project, this playground, uh, ready for the start of the school year. Um, I also want to thank the, the parents of the Washington School community for their patience um, because they, they have been very patient with us. Um, but I think we're, as Mr. Brightman cited, we, we want to follow through our due diligence, do it appropriately. Uh, and then finally, I want to just say that I, we're excited about this because VGS was also the same company that oversaw the, the creation and the, the building out of the Roosevelt playground, and that's received rave reviews. Um, so I think they understand the, the expectation of our community overall, and uh, we'll make sure that there there's some nuances that are unique to to the Washington community, but nonetheless, we've been pleased with their work. So just a couple other footnotes to add to this uh, conversation. Thank you. I have a question. What was the um, construction company able to submit a timeline just so parents have an idea of when things are going to be completed? They will be doing that next once they're hired on after being approved. Sure. That's one of the first things they'll do is give us a very um, detailed timeline of when things will be finalized as far as design, which is pretty much there, um, and what they plan to do as far as bid timelines and procurement and all those things. Great. Well, that be made public. I know, you know, just yes. the Washington families are very anxious to see when some of this work is going to get started and completed. So, yeah, we're doing weekly updates to the Washington community, and so we'll continue to have that type of information front and center with Grand Landing. This is breaking news, however. Right? Uh, pending your vote this evening, this would be a really, to your point, Ms. Willis, this is really a pivotal moment in the project. So, sure. pending your vote. Great. Thank you. As a Washington alumnus myself, uh, <laughs> so good. I would just like to have a clarification, a point of clarification. So the Washington elementary layout has a north and south playground. One is green and yellow themed and the other is purple and blue. Are both of them being reconstructed? Is it just one? I would like some clarification with that. It is, it is both sides. Okay. Both north and south. <laughs> and you. in the middle, kind of. Yeah. And like the field area there? Yeah, it's, it's a, well, it's an asphalt field kind of behind the school that wraps into the south area. Yeah, it's like the, and then the north area with the basketball and all. It's the, like, like the weird parking lot thing. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah. The question is yes. <laughs> For those of you not familiar with Washington, it is nestled in a really interesting spot between two streets and kind of a, a roundabout in the midst of it. Um, so I'm really fascinated to see, and, and I know that the the, the student, I, my, my assumption is the students and families will be involved in giving feedback on, on and so on, but it is, they're going to have to get creative because it is a unique layout. It is not simply, Roosevelt's a little bit more straightforward with a part of a half a block. Uh, and so there's a lot of interesting creative opportunities there, but your question's well taken. Like. There's a lot of opportunities due to some little hidey spots back there. Ms. Biefeld. Thank you. I was going to follow up on your question too because, um, you know, sometimes when we bring these documents forward, having a drawing really does help put it in perspective and, and then also to ask about 
the greater community feedback. So, you know, there are obviously some neighbors in the area that will be interested in seeing this and other members of the community who have expertise to look at the the type of equipment being designed and the and the access for the design. So I'm not sure how we will go forward with extending listening sessions or um, you know review sessions to the greater community out even you know outside of the Washington families like actual school families yeah, I can see what we can do about the outside communication but to the Washington community it's been very tight over the last mm -hmm. six months or so but um, and the project was approved by the board back last March which included really the scope and I believe mm -hmm. the drawings and things were part of that discussion and approval it was just getting to this point to be able to have the construction manager in, in place to then move the project forward in, in the proper way. Right. So that's what I would ask is just in the future, can we link that information? And if there are any changes to that, um, it just it's just so much time passes sure. and then people right. engage at different times. So we want to do our best to keep everyone informed. And this is an exciting thing. I mean, playgrounds used to be very hard to come by in our district like and so we're actually replacing them on a more frequent basis which is wonderful because you know that's what we need to be doing um so that's my request if yes, you would consider it thanks yes, mr mark any community comment on this item. Okay. Uh, we have two hands raised online now. Julie Alexander, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Okay, my name is Julie Alexander. I'm at 7224 West State Street, Unit 1A in Wauwatosa. Um, I um, just want to say that um, I know that we talked about this all last March, uh, but I'm a little concerned about seeing the final plans and accessibility issues here. So um, I would, it would be nice to take a look at that a little bit. Um, and I know that uh, the school district uh, said that they'd be working with uh, our committee and I haven't seen that yet. So I, that, that was just my comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, BJ Ermans. You have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Thank you. This is BJ Ermans, address 2749 North 75th Street, and a member of the uh, Commission for Persons with Disabilities. And I thank uh, Board Member Mufeld for uh, mentioning the fact that there should be some community involvement, but especially for our commission. So I'm also agreeing with the Chair Julie uh, that we have an opportunity to look at the plans uh, and offer input and suggestions. Um, it's something we are also studying for the parks area. Uh, and it would be great to have consistency throughout the city of Wauwatosa and all the school grounds that we are learning from each other and working together to make sure that all facilities for children and children of all ages uh, are uh, consistent and accommodate everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you both. I think really important comments. Those are things that have really been a priority for the district uh, in all of our renovations. Uh, reminded me of our earlier comment too about the Ability Center uh, and the work with Damian Buckman and that group are doing some really phenomenal forward thinking stuff and would be a great resource to engage with uh, as well. I think we're ready to call the roll. Ms. Mielfeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessup Inger? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mrs. Ms. Willis? Yes. And that item passes. 
Next up is a presentation and action to report, approve the creation of a finance and resource standing board committee. Leanne. It is recommended that the school board approve the creation of a standing finance and resource committee and I so move. Second. Thank you, that was quick. Um, Mr. Brightman, Mr. Phillips. Sure. I'm sharing from over here. <coughs> yeah, I'm sharing from over here. Oh, <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> I'll do it again. Power moves. Yeah. <laughs> Mike showing off his suit. Oh, yes. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Oh, good. So uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for allowing uh, us to, to come back a second time. Uh, your comments and suggestions a couple weeks ago were uh, really impactful and I did my best to incorporate those into the slide. But if you see an opportunity of something that I may have missed, please, uh, please let me know. I want to go back through and do the what, why and how of a finance and resource committee. Um, and, and then for the folks that were not able to attend a couple of weeks ago, and then uh, turn it over to you all for for any feedback. So, on the on the so on the, on the why, right? So when you look at the five uh, core functions of school boards, you'll see that a finance and resource committee really touches a couple of them um, profoundly. And I've circled those under relationships, whether that's relationships with our vendors, um, relationships with um, you know contractors that we use, relationships with uh, different parts of the school district, whether that's um, you know tech or whether that's recreation department, things like that. And then the other part of the core uh, functions that it touches is accountability. So provides a structure and a framework, um, a reporting structure, um, the ability for a smaller group, a more nimble uh, group, to be able to take a look at things before they come to the the board to be able to send things back that need work uh, before they come to the board and really uh, you'll see in the appendix of the last slide a schedule of uh, the for this committee to review key uh, key things as we work on them and and, and uh, our resources on this on the next slide here you talk look at um, these uh, core these these um, legal powers and duties uh, of the school board there are eight of them here and uh, this this committee will really be focused on a couple of things. One is provide that oversight for administration uh, by establishing that framework of accountability, so that reporting structure. And then we spend so much time building a um, strategic plan and, and item number six is, is around operations and finance. And so it's, it's for us to be able to allocate resources that support the strategic plan. If we're haphazard about that, then we're not gonna really bring to fruition um, the goals and priorities that we set out in that strategic plan. So this is really aligned to um, you know, really align our, our our priorities our, our goals and our resources into one into one straightforward ahead um, initiative so what what it is it's a standing committee uh, some of the feedback that we had from a couple weeks ago was um, that the board treasurer would be uh, a person assigned to the committee and one or more voting school members along with the chief financial officer as an ex officio member so members of the Finance and Resource Committee will be appointed by the board president for a term of one year on the, on the committee. Uh, of course, the uh, superintendent and staff and, and uh, will be encouraged to attend when those uh, areas that, that come up for discussion are, are bring. So we'll, we'll make sure and be as inclusive as possible when uh, when we're talking about areas inside of the inside of the district that we make sure and have the directors, key staff, um, stakeholders as well being in attendance, um, being more proactive about that. Another thing that was brought up last time, which is a really good cause, the involvement of city government, city committee members, community members, like all, is very much encouraged. Like how can we, like with the, the you know, the Damien thing, the, the Ability Center, a perfect example of how we can reach out um, to our community at large to create synergies between us and city government around uh, around how we deploy our resources because we share a lot of resources. So um, I think that was a really good catch and a really good recommendation um, that was brought up last time. Uh, 
You know, the goal is to meet monthly, review resources, budget, buildings, grounds, and technology. You know, some of our major spending categories um, will be uh, will be covered in this in this committee. And with every, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll try to be as, as transparent as possible. We'll keep minutes. They'll be published. All meetings will be made public. Um, they'll be uh, a part of the district website so that anybody that's interested can easily find out when these meetings are um, and, and can participate. We encourage that participation. So the more diversity of thought, the more diversity of attendance, the better pro uh, product we're going to have. So how? So it, and so how we're going to uh, go about this is there's really three pillars with which uh, the Finance and Resource Committee will operate. Those three pillars are the budget and finance, the numbers on the paper. So um, which also include our external relationships, our internal procedures, making sure we're being efficient, we're being uh, safe in our internal procedures, uh, our budget alignment and budget planning, which uh, Mr. Brightman talked about a little bit earlier tonight. We're being proactive about that. Buildings and grounds. So another resource, another major resource that we have as a district is our buildings and grounds. Are they accessible? Um, are there our community uh, you know, members using them for for different things? Are we are we making it easy for folks to um, use our buildings and grounds? You know, where do we have opportunities to, uh, you know, to increase accessibility for, for all? You know, how do we get into a better rhythm around our facility planning and our long range planning around, you know, some of those hard resources that we have at the district? And then the third pillar is around our technology. You know, how are we investing in technology? What's, what's upcoming for technology? How will we be proactive about that? Again, accessibility, right? Does everyone have the technology that they need to do their best work? You know, how about our on online resources, our district website, um, things like that, and our technology resource planning. Again, trying to be transparent and proactive um, about that third pillar of the Finance and Resource Committee. And then lastly, it's pretty small, but you'll see, um, if you want to zoom in, you'll see uh, the monthly uh, proposal of monthly items that will be coming to uh, before um, this committee be reviewed, you can see like there's a finance committee F and then board where board will get the, that same information, but you'll see that the committee will have an opportunity to, to weigh in, you know, to apply on that stuff, to, you know, to, to take a look at it before it comes to the board. And also I'll, I'll be, if, if I'm put in there, I'll be uh, bringing that, that committee work back to the board on a regular basis. So that's kind of where, where we, where we are uh, and hopefully where we're going. So take it. Any questions or comments? Mr. Mark. Thank you. So this is an ask. Mm -hmm. It's not something I need to see tonight for the vote. Um, we had discussions on dollar amount of spending requiring board approval. Mm -hmm. And the policy, yeah. Yeah. And I look at that and I say, well, not all six figure dollar amounts are the same. Right. That we could have something that's um, a purchase, a first time purchase, where the board has never reviewed the vendors, where the board has never seen, yeah, you know, something like that, or a one time purchase. Mm -hmm. And I would think not necessarily it would. It come to well everything comes to the full board eventually but the idea that that there be this dollar threshold for board approval i think misses some nuance about can we have dollar thresholds that reflect the type of purchase it is you know if we're if we buy chromebooks so many a year well, we know we buy Chromebooks and here's the, and it's a big dollar amount. Well, if the finance committee looked at it, I don't know that the, you know, it could be on the consent agenda for the board and, yeah. and where in the past, some board members appropriately so would say, well, anything of, of a particular dollar amount shouldn't be on the consent agenda. <laughs> I think rather than come to the board with a $1 amount fits all, if, if if somehow the dollar amounts reflect the nature of the purchase and the and the work done by the finance committee for review, did, am I making sense with what I'm saying here? That it's just not a one dollar amount fits all, right. and new and, versus renew. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, 
you know, you, you know capital versus mm -hmm. expense. You, you know, there's. I think you could do a lot in that area to um, help our oversight by sort of um, targeting surgically what the board brings up for discussion without having like one broad fell swoop, boom, this dollar amount, yes, this other dollar amount, no. So I'd ask, it's an ask that that be one of the things you you consider as as a as a committee. It'll be a that will be a joint exercise with the policy committee. Um, so because right. you know, since it's governed by policy, we'll act right. as a subject matter expert when it comes yeah. time to to go at that policy, then I think that will be where the two committees may come together to help resolve that, um, what you're talking about, Mr. Right. Ryan. That's another conversation I'm a little, a, a lot actually uncomfortable with sort of the policy committee becoming the everything committee and it becomes the surrogate school board. So um, I understand what you're saying, but by the same token, you know, yes, it would ultimately be policy. Yeah. and. The policy committee and its sophistication would say, well, is this something that the finance committee recommends? Right. And therefore, we don't have to go deep into it as a policy committee. Along the same lines as the spending limits that context matters as far as the depth and the forum where we consider things. Okay, thank you. Understood. Thank you. Smithon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips, because I was a Zoom board member last meeting. So I. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I like um, I like the structure. I have a couple of questions organizationally. How will the committee work? How will the committee define the work and publish agendas on a regular basis early enough dates? And agenda items early enough so that people know mm. to come when they're interested and they they can prepare if needed and and that would be another question of preparedness yeah. um, for committee members um you know the responsibilities of the administration basically the how mm -hmm. to work together that will be defined at one of your first couple meetings with that yeah, I think that's fair to that's a fair assumption. Well, the idea, at least the way I've been thinking about it, was we, it would be a standing monthly committee on a standing date, mm -hmm. right? So there won't be anything that'll be in flux from from month to month. Um, if that's if that works with the workload that we have, and then that uh, I think if you if you go to the last page, you'll see the actual work that's mapped out for each month, mm -hmm. a year in advance. So anybody that wants so anybody that wants to be involved in that month's work um, can see it far in advance, and then we'll also be publishing on board docs um, as as detailed as we can be, um, as far in advance as we can. Well, I I and I agree with that. I think that's great. It's just when the you know that sometimes the meetings might generate items, mm -hmm. action items, or other investigative items or something like that. So a, a tracking of maybe those items that come up that may not be on the monthly schedule. That, we'll have minutes um, yeah. that we'll be keeping and that will be public um, okay. as well that we can send out to the board or I can even report back to the board on. But that's where those items, you'll be able to see those items in flight as we as they come up. Yeah, I mean, I can see this high visibility and it really, um, is a nice, it really is a nice layout with, um, you know, everything that we're doing uh, for resources and how we're funding them. Um, I also agree with Mr. Meyer's comment on the thresholds of spending and categories of, of spending and the why behind you were bringing forward something and how. Mm -hmm. um, and then a question for the board uh, president, will this come, uh, the nominations, uh, come before the board for approval, as is our custom, after um, the, the board president appoints, will it come to the school board agenda so we can vote on it? Yep. Um, and I think thinking about starting a new thing too, we'll also give everyone a high five who agrees to do the extra work for being on a committee. Okay. So board 
board consent uh, as well. Yeah, just well, because we want to make sure yeah, that we're and, all in agreement on who's on the committee. Yeah, and you know? Last time, if you think, if you re recall from the policy committee, uh, when I made appointments this year, um, that occurred as well. Uh, it is not within our bylaws that it needs to. Uh, but I'm going to, I certainly during my time as president, I will continue to do that. I appreciate um, it. I think it really shows transparency. And honestly, you know, the administration could say, well, really, you're going to put that board member on there? I mean, yeah. just kidding. The, kidding. Totally and, kidding. And but, what you know. <laughs> what I what I would say, and I'll, I'll jump on this because I think you're, you're of the question, timing of your question. Uh, we, if this is approved tonight, we will have three standing board committees. Um, and what I would like to do is kind of make sure that we've got board representation on each of them. Ideally, if the board president wasn't sitting on one of them, uh, since the board president has kind of other administrative responsibilities, that would be beneficial, I would say, uh, for anyone who's sat in the seat. Um, I'd appreciate that. So, and it would also allow me to kind of attend a variety of different meetings to kind of pop in, observe, um, and, and be involved, be aware of what, what's happening across all three of them. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I've, got a email that'll be coming out later this week um, of kind of a variety of different governance topics and areas and um, kind of the next couple months of areas for professional development for the board, a board self eval. And another one is kind of who would like to do, who would like to be sitting on what committees. And so we might have a, a mid-year shuffle um, in, the, in, in one case, and I'll be looking for folks who would be interested in serving on this committee as well. Um, so, Thank you. Uh, for those in the community, uh, if this community, if this committee, and we haven't voted yet, is approved, we would have a legislative advocacy committee, a policy committee, and then a finance and operations committee. So those would be the three standing board committees here in Wauwatosa. Mr. Meyer. Well, I want to build on Mrs. Muefeld's comment, and I hope I'm not misunderstanding her comment, and to compliment the chair, the the idea of the appointment of committee members, just so the community understands, this board has had statements from two law firms saying that it is legal for the president to make a secret appointment to a committee. Now, you can't do anything with that because you have to have a public meeting, but that's why it's so important to me what Dr. Jessup Anger said that he's going to, how he plans to operate that, and Mrs. Mufel's request that it come to the board. I think it's a, a bridge building and collaboration thing to, to, you know, just because you can, doesn't mean it's a good idea. I mean, you know, that's kind of one of those adages in life. Um, and then I want to thank Mr. Phillips that um, and coming in here, I was a no vote tonight. And, but of course, I, I listened to what's presented. And this particular concerns I had with a, a finance committee right now with this school board were directly answered by Mr. Phillips' presentation. And I understand there were slides, but it said the same thing. But to hear somebody commit to things matters. So I thank Mr. Phillips and I, I will support this motion. Um, I think this is a good idea that we have this committee. Thank you. Dr. Hoyt. Mr. Meyer, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, when you spoke previously, you, you said you had some reservations or concerns. I'm not sure exactly what wording you used about the policy committee becoming kind of like a de facto school board. I just want to understand what you mean by that for the sake of kind of open communication. Oh, I didn't mean anything negative about the people on the committee or how they're operating, but it seemed like so many things that comes up, well, the policy committee will do it. Well, the policy committee will do it. Well, the policy committee will do it. It's like, how are they going to do all that stuff? And so I just thought not to make it a reflection on anybody, but as a matter of our paradigm for operating, it's like, are we really going to expect these two people to do everything? And, and I know we don't expect that, but I, I don't know how, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm hearing it in a way that it's not actually being said. You know, I'm not picking it up the way people are laying it down. 
but it just seems like so many things. Well, the policy committee will do it. Like, well, okay. Um, it, it seems to be too much just sent to a couple people. I don't care who they are. And shouldn't the board take up some of those things? So I'm liking the notion that you establish the, the policy committee, establish some paradigms for, okay, sure, you're going to send this stuff to us and everything ultimately becomes policy, you know, like it becomes a ways and means committee or something. So you, you're, you touch everything, but there's no way anybody can be expert on everything like that. And, and it wouldn't be fair if you could be expert to expect that you would be expert on everything and everybody else could just come in and vote yes. And you all did all the work, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so that's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. I wasn't meaning it to be anything negative. I just thought it's like, this just is just too much from the way it sounds and, and the way I'm hearing to, to my ears, mm -hmm. which why I talk here is so that we, you know, well, this is I'm here, how I'm hearing it. Yeah. Are you meaning it that way? And I'm, I'm hearing you don't really mean it that way. Um, so, you know, just cause, you know, we have to pay for everything when we write a check, that doesn't mean the people who write the checks, the people who print the checks aren't gonna decide everything, but it does, you, you know, the, what is it that you're really supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Or is there something that in the province of the policy committee that is uniquely for the policy committee? You, you know, like, um, oh, election of board officers, or, I mean, that was a long discussion a few years ago about how we operate with the ballots and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, that was- So I appreciate that, that clarification. I mean. yeah. um, do you know, Mr. President, when we are going to, when the policy committee will be reporting kind of our, our initial plan? So we can certainly agenda that for our next meeting in November. Uh, what we will need to be adding in is kind of ongoing updates from each of the three different committees on a monthly basis. Okay. Uh, and it, it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, and I'll ask each of the committee chairs to, to share about what they think is most appropriate. Okay. Because I think that would be helpful, Mr. Meyer, if we could kind of help explain to the rest of the board sort of the the way we're planning to sort of tackle policy. Because yeah. it is, it's too much Right. To do so, all in the next six months. I mean, you know, I, yeah. I think tonight brought forward a good example. Well, is the policy committee really going to go as deeply into the financial processes as the finance committee? Right. Well, how, right. why would you double up the work even? Why have a right. finance committee then? So there would be things where you'd say, okay, finance committee, just like with the purchasing levels, mm -hmm. with the dollar amount. Well, that's their role to really dig into that. It comes to the policy committee. It's like, okay, did finance committee like it? Is there anything compelling here why we should not like it? Mm -hmm. Versus, yeah, we have to draft you two on the policy committee. You have to draft these these word this wordsmith. You have yeah. to draft the words yourself. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, that's that's kind of an example. Yeah, you know. and I think we'll be tapping into lots of administrative yeah. assistance as well for, you know budgeting ish, budgeting policy, human resources policy. So yeah, definitely we'll be asking for lots of help along the way. Yeah, by the same token, you've heard me say, my belief, things where the two of you, board member Willis and board member Hoyk, have particular expertise that the rest of the board does not have. I would think that would be something the board would be grateful to have you all dig into it and you actually write the words yourself about the various things. And that might be a situational thing. We happen to have the expertise there now. So we wouldn't bring it necessarily at an authoring level to the full board because our two board experts are on the committee. So just what makes sense. Yeah. I'm going to uh, see if I can bring it back to the finance committee uh, and, and a quick clarification. So in uh, the the board president by current policy has the purview to be able to appoint anybody on the board. Um, what generally I, I uh, have done thus far during my term is I've asked several people, would you be willing to serve? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Um, and then those who are willing to serve, I then appointed and brought back to the board. I can't speak to what's happened over the 20 plus years on 20, 30 years back, but 
kind of that's the norm. I presume that the policy committee will, as they look at the bylaws, kind of take a look at that and, and kind of codify uh, something that's maybe more clarifying. Um, so the big takeaway for the board is you should be thinking about which committee you would like to serve on, because um, I will be asking soon. Um, any other board comment on the finance committee? Ms. Fraley. This is going out to the student school board members as well. You should be thinking about which committees sound interesting to you. Um, and not that that is a formal part of your, you know, responsibility, but I think it's uh, an interesting window into something in more depth um, that, you know, depending on what your interest is, you may have more interest in joining the finance committee where that's not where I would want to spend my time per se, um, but everybody has their thing. So think about, you know, if you're interested in advocacy, you might want to come sit in on the next LAC meeting, or if you're interested in policy, go sit in on the next meeting with them. So that's an opportunity for you. Cool. Anything else? Yeah, may, may I make a part? Yeah, what? I was just going to okay. see you. There's somebody else. Okay. Last comment. So a term from the political pub science world is lame duck a lame duck legislator and a lame duck legislator will be for example after this november congressional election um congress meeting after the election before the end of the term of office is a lame duck and they do things and and they won't be accountable later because they might not have been elected i've always been like really uncomfortable with the outgoing board president making appointments as as lame duck president just before you know the new board is seated in may and sometimes statutorily we have to you know there's a couple of things that the, it, it expires like in april and the board president has to do that and i don't know whether the policy committee wants to look at this or the finance committee about when i mean i know you're going to populate this committee now with these appointments but ongoing does this board want appointments made by the outgoing president in the last month of the presidency or try to hold them for the incoming president at, you know, there's arguments both ways, but I just ask that we ask the question and answer it explicitly eventually down the road. That's something I'd probably ask the treasury uh, treasurer to take a look at. Just didn't want to throw it to the policy committee. <laughs> Um, any community comment on this item? I'll be honest, I kind of thought this was the one everybody was here for tonight. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, any, Jamie, anything online? No, there are no hands raised. Okay. Ms. Calderon? Ms. Mulefeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessup Inger? Yes. Dr. Hoyk? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. And that item passes. Congratulations uh, and thank you to Mr. Phillips and Mr. Brightman. Um, I know you've been conceptually thinking about this for a while. Uh, I'm excited. Um, Mr. Phillips, I'll be asking for you to serve on this committee. Then I'll be appointing you, so thanks in advance. And I'll be looking for others to join him as well. Um, next item up is our monthly financial report. I've lost track of where we are. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Our monthly financial report. Yes, on board docs, we have the September uh, financial report out for your review. Um, there were no material variances to report, nothing unusual. This is the first uh, month with a school year payroll on it and school year expenditures. So you'll see that represented as part of the report. Um, the last page shows all of our expenditures over that $20,000 mark um, that you get on every report to for review. Um, again, nothing atypical there. The two projects at the bottom, one for $200,000, one for just under a million, are referendum projects um, that were approved by the board as, as part of the process. So. Um, again, fairly routine month again, early in the school year. So love more to report as we move through the year. Any board comment or question? I prefer my financial reports boring. Um, <laughs> thank you. Glad to hear everything is looking as it should. Any community comment on this item? Jamie, anything online? 
No hands raised. Thank you. Um, we are at the end of our agenda for the evening. Uh, the last item is public comment on any non-agenda items for this evening. Um, any? I was just going to say, I think it was Ms. Jellick. Jenning had spoken in the beginning. Yep. Would you like to? Thank you. Again, it's Kelly Jenick um, on uh, North Ave and 66th Street. I have three students in the district um, at Roosevelt Elementary. Uh, one of them is a special needs child. Um, so my uh, comment is in, in um, reference to the HR report that was presented earlier. Um, I have read the report. Um, I, I am concerned about the section stating that wages would not be raised for the special ed teachers and assistants. Uh, until next school year, um, especially given the 26 open FTEs for special uh, ed assistance or uh, for assistance, excuse me. Um, and the challenge the challenges that were stated earlier in filling those positions. Um, my son's IEP states that he needs one on one assistance throughout the school day. Um, he gets one on two um, assistance because of the short handed staffing. At the present time, this does put strain on the assistant, um, and it also means that there's less focus time for both my son and his peer. Um, we also learned just recently that his special ed teacher is resigning and moving to another school district, putting further strain um, on the staff that's already strained, um, and meaning um, you know less uh, less um, services that are provided to my son and to um, to his peers. Um, this holding the wage and, and um, you know, mounting the challenge and filling these open positions does mean that disadvantaged students remain at an even further disadvantage um, and that the strained employees remain even more strained. Um, I would uh, kindly like to ask that the board would rethink um, and reevaluate raising the wages sooner than next school year. Um, or at least something in the short term, which I think was um, asked about earlier, uh, to make sure that these uh, positions are filled. We think the world of the assistant that is working with my son and, and the staff that work with him throughout the day, um, and really want to make sure that these people are given, you know, everything that they need to, to be successful and to help, um, again, the most disadvantaged students in our district. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for hearing my comment. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Hey, good evening. My name is Bill Brewer. I live in the Slinger School District. Um, I want to first of all say thank you for allowing members outside of your school district to make public comment. It's really appreciated. So um, earlier, this is Mulefeld, is that I say that right? You made a comment about how a picture really provides additional or you know needed perspective when you're talking about the playgrounds and that sort of thing. I couldn't agree more. Um, I came tonight because I'm really troubled, and I'm troubled primarily, at, at least at the start, by an illustration, an illustration from your human growth and development curriculum for five-year-olds to see explicit female genitalia and even with an x at the most critical place a local news reporter tonight said i can't even show that to the public when i see an illustration like that that provides me with perspective and i'm going to ask each of you and the parents in this community and the students to really search yourself for this what's the purpose of that illustration is it to teach accurate biology to five and six year olds? Or is it something else? I don't think you need that kind of an illustration to teach accurate biology. It's not gonna be used for that any more than teaching white privilege in that myth helps you to teach accurate history about our nation. That's a folly. The purpose behind that illustration is to desensitize kids to what should be taught at later ages at a more appropriate time. 
And as we continue to build on that for a five and six year old, I have to ask myself, what's next? Do I need to see what else is next to know what the goals are by the time that child becomes a graduate of that same school district? And all that time, some of the most formative years, we've desensitized these kids to accept as now normal what is not normal, and that is exposure to this stuff. It also points me to the abdication, unfortunately, that so many parents in our nation have had, giving up their God-given rights and authorities as, as parents to teach these kinds of things to their kids in the privacy of their own homes. That's not an advocation. 30 seconds. Thank you very much. It's not an advocation to hide it at all. It's the parent's responsibility to teach those things. It's the school district's responsibility if you're given that privilege to conduct technical education for these kids and not social education, not desensitizing, sexualization, desensitizing, and those sorts of things. So I'm asking you to search your souls. Don't worry about policies. Search your hearts. Ask yourself, am I doing the right You're time? Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hello, school board members. Um, my name is Amy White, and I live um, at 68th and Blanchard Street near the village. Thank you for allowing additional comments at the end of the meeting tonight. I was tired, as we all are, but you do this all the time. So I thought that I could hop off of Zoom and drive here um, and provide some public comment. As I've shared before, I was on the external committee to reevaluate the HGD curriculum. Thank you for approving it. The process was long and all parents were emailed the opportunity to participate last November, almost a full year ago now. A reminder for some, um, for some that families can opt out of any individual lesson or all lessons. This has always been the case. For any parents who have been in this district for at least a year, they know that a handout for parents to review and sign regarding the opt out option and information is sent by email weeks prior to the start of HGD with multiple email reminders. This has happened every year for my two kids who are now in eighth and 10th grade. Um, the curriculum update was sorely needed. It was outdated and I think that the outcome is a good one. This is a public school district that bases its decisions on hardworking committees and experts and parents and teachers and doctors and social workers and disability rights activists and a pastor and that's not a comprehensive list. I know the content of this curriculum and I support it. I'd rather have one of our amazing Wauwatosa teachers who choose to teach this curriculum present this fact-based, scientifically sound information, then leave it up to chance that the information they're exposed to online through social media or Discord servers, which we all know middle schoolers are on, that that might be okay. I trust the teachers more. I am most upset, frustrated, and sad, however, that extremist groups or even people external to Wauwatosa School District are targeting our school board meetings. And I support you as a board if you decide to put more stringent guidelines for public attendance and conversation in place, such as requiring a Wauwatosa address via driver's license or an electric bill or tax bill, just like we do as parents when we need to re-enroll our kids every year in the district um, to be able to enter this room and speak. And that's extra work, someone at the door who has to check this, but um, the, some of the extremist group tonight heckled and hassled the local crowd members prior to the meeting. It was not good and made an older elementary school kid cry. It was awful and scary. And I urge you to consider ways to limit the involvement of these harassing extremist groups that are external to our district and our city. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Stott, outside. I wasn't going to speak. About Excuse me, can you share your address? Oh, uh, I'm Milwaukee. I think did, so, did you say Milwaukee Avenue? Yeah. No, I'm Milwaukee, no, the city. Oh, so not from Wauwatosa. And not from Delta. And I thank you for giving me the time. I wasn't going to speak, but I wanted to counter what was uh, just said. Uh, the opt-out option is not available for everything in the external and internal uh, curriculum development uh, committees. Uh, they take various topics, pink and uh, yellow, uh, which uh, were available for intern or uh, they call them a universal 
uh, which make it them topics that can be brought up mainly. And I think this paper say social studies in English. Uh, so there aren't opt-out features on that. Um, uh, there's also, I want to bring up, and uh, this will be uh, more to Mr. Meyer, <clears throat> uh, the a definition that the uh, curriculum I used was uh, for equity. I don't know if uh, you've heard it before because I didn't uh, see your name on the uh, uh, slideshows. The constant act of everyone engaging in purposeful educational social justice leadership to disrupt acts of injustice that dismantle systems of oppression, marginalization, and produce disparities. And now from watching the videos, I can tell your politics agree with that part. That uh, but as a lawyer, I want to point you to uh, two, uh, two main things, the constant act of everyone. Uh, so this is a totalizing uh, critique, or it's a totalizing mission into alignment on a political view in the entire school district while the state DPI, <laughs> while the state uh, DPI uh, talks about a, a diverse uh, viewpoint uh, base in schools. And if you haven't heard the uh, terminology social justice leadership before, social justice leadership is the practice of keeping social justice as a main focus uh, to eliminate the, the discrimination based on a number of identity groups. And therefore, the district's mission is to keep social justice at the center of everything. Sir, so just, just a moment. Board. I want to make sure. I would ask that you not address any specific school board member, that you address the board, uh, sure, or uh, myself as chair. Okay, I'm sorry, chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, so social justice uh, leadership means that, uh, centering social justice for everything, on everything, and you, uh, your district uh, mission is to eliminate inequity. That means bringing everyone on board politically. Thank you. Seeing no other public comment in the room. Jamie, anything online? We have three hands raised. BJ Ermitz, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Thank you very much. I am BJ Ermitz, 2749 North 75th Street, and member of the Commission for Persons with Disabilities. I'm very glad to hear how inclusive the school board is being regarding asking for community input, uh, especially uh, in mentioning the abilities group uh, for things such as the new playgrounds. I would ask that uh, in addition, or possibly even before considering outside groups, that you uh, make it a point to reach out to the internal groups who focus on some of these areas, such as the Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Um, I highly respect the work that the Abilities Group is doing. One point I would like people to remember is that they focus on mobility issues only. Uh, and that is admirable. That is a huge area and they're accomplishing wonderful things. However, they are not considering other disabilities, which our commission does keep in mind. Things such as uh, people with vision disabilities, even to the point of full blindness. There are surfaces, for example, that make it difficult for them to transverse with their canes. Uh, and this includes playgrounds. So I would ask that you uh, please keep us in mind when these things are coming up, and especially with the newly approved Finance and Resources Committee, especially since they are not only dealing with facilities and to that end, I would make a point of saying that some of the facilities are also used as polling places, and we need to keep some of those needs in mind when we're talking um, about it for people with disabilities, as well as technology. And technology has come a long way, but in some cases, uh, people out on the internet are not doing as well as they might for helping with screen readers that are required by people with vision loss, just as one example. 
So please keep our commission in mind going forward. And thank you very much for all that you do and the careful thought that you put into everything that that you that you do do and decide. Thank you. Okay, next is Scott Shelnut. You have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi there, uh, Scott Shelnut, 815 Glenview Avenue, apartment four. Um, so first off, the board members, I don't know how you guys do it, dealing with all this BS from all these people that aren't even from Wauwatosa. Some of them were respectful tonight. Others were batshit crazy. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, but this is ridiculous for me to sit here and, and watch these online. And I should have drove over there like some of the other people. But um, I want to applaud you for the you know, good choices that you've been making and moving the curriculum, curriculum forward. Uh, some of the stuff talked about tonight. I mean, there's infinite. I mean, the whole grooming narrative. And I don't know how, you know, some of these people <clears throat> show up and just create so much tension and so much, there's so much hate. There's so much hate that was there tonight. Um, and I just don't understand the attacks and why people keep targeting Wauwatosa. Um, and I guess don't let the, the loud few, you know, uh, upset you guys. Cause again, uh, you do this all the time. I don't know how you do it. I guess I'll have to run for school board to to see what it's all about. Apparently, there's uh, some excitement to it. But um, I would say to anyone that is there tonight or listening or to do some of their own research online, especially for some of these people that spoke tonight that are just so far out there, um, I really encourage people to actually look at the human growth development. I'm looking at it right now and I can't find any of these uh, horrific things that people keep talking about because I believe they're just hearing it secondhand and not doing research for themselves. And uh, that's unfortunate that, again, our school board has to listen to this month after month after month of people who share something on social media, they read a headline and magically, they're an expert. I mean, all these people are experts. Um, so again, thank you for all that you do. And I'm sorry again for the few hateful people that spoke tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank next, you. next is, uh, Deb Falk Palak. You have the microphone. Oops. Sorry. Um, Deb just disappeared. Oh, she's raised her hand again. Deb Falk Palak, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. All right. Thanks, Jamie. I pulled my hand down too quick. Um, hi again, Deb Falk Palak. Um, first of all, I really liked what Mr. Phillips laid out about the Finance and Resource Committee and how to notify the um, community. And just if, if we could have some idea of how we can see minutes from legislative advocacy and the policy committee. Thanks, Ms. Fraley. I know you said you were going to work on getting those. And um, I know one of my fellow PTA council officers is on, and we'd love to be able to share that at our council meeting next week, um, what's happening to see how we can support some of these things too. And same with policy committee, if you have minutes, if those can somehow be figured out how to share out with the community. I liked what Mr. Phillips outlined with how, you know, his committee, he would um, start to share those things. And I wanted to talk about, I'm, I'm really happy to see that we're on this review cycle now or getting on a review cycle of curriculum. And I saw science is up uh, first. And I, I, I really, really want to make sure that when we're looking at any curriculum, whether it's science, social studies, math, what have you, 
that we are looking at the materials the district has for children who take the alternate alternate curriculum. Um, my only issue that I've brought up with the human growth and development was the fact that there was no evidence that this was looked at, that the materials from 1988 seemed to have been okay, and we did not look at other curriculum that is more current and out there. So when things come forward to the board or administration is looking at, the, you know, don't even wait until that point where several members of the community have to bring forward, what about us? Um, let's make sure that us includes all of us, not 98% of kids, not 99% of kids, but all of children when we look at the curriculum. And lastly, um, this month is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. If you've been on the board or in, in administration, you've heard me talk about this. Um, um, and this year's theme, the national theme is disability, part of the equity equation. And I would love to encourage our administrators to look at the website. There's a lot of good information for schools, how schools can um, celebrate um, persons with disabilities and see people with disabilities as future members of the employment sector. So, um, or even getting down to in human resources, who are we, are, are we looking to diversify our applicant pool by reaching out and working with organizations to find qualified applicants with disabilities? Do we know who those organizations are to reach out to? Um, if not, you know, once again, this committee of, of disability gets going. Yeah, we are district. Time. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next is um, Julie Alexander. You have the microphone. Please state okay. your name and address. I, okay, I don't have the microphone. I, do you hear me? Yeah, we yes. hear you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, uh, first off, I just really want to say that um, I have really been enjoying lately the discussions that all of the board has been uh, going through. Uh, I really appreciate uh, everyone being a participant and being on the board here. Um, and uh, I just really uh, appreciate each of you. So I just want you to know that. Um, I... On the other hand, I'm, I also want to let you know that I'm really happy that you're looking at the a finance committee as as well as approving the other committees because I think that that will help improve uh, the board in terms of uh, helping them really be able to uh, provide the services that they need to and keep on track with finance and benefits for the district. Uh, I know that uh, basically um, I'm also thinking about the mother uh, that talked uh, talked about the need for um, for increased pay for special ed special ed assistance, et cetera here. And I really uh, would like you to possibly think about that because I know this year, we're, we're, we're having more and more people with special needs that are in the district. Uh, and it's, it's a daunting, it's a daunting issue. And I know that the budget is tight, but just to think about that and sort of see if there's a way of doing something this year would be helpful. Uh, and uh, also uh, I, this is disability awareness empowerment month um, and uh, really looking at people with disabilities as being part of the equity equ equation here uh, for the administration on 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 down would be great. Uh, Seventy six percent of people with disabilities are not employed, so it's a big issue. And we've, as uh, as the commission that I work for for Wautosa, you know, we're really looking at that as a that is an issue as well. But it's just, I mean, the school has a part in this too. So I'm uh, just trying to see if there's a way of seeing if we can make a little bit of a dent of some sort. So uh, thank you so much for listening to my comments and I hope every one of you have a nice evening. Thank you.
Jamie, I see we've got one more person online, then I'm gonna come back and see if there's anybody. I'm gonna request if anybody's got something awesome that they wanna share with the community of things going on. Uh, lots of cool things happening uh, at East and West and the middle schools, lots of music and theater and athletics. Um, so if anybody wants to, we'll swing back anybody in the room if you wanna brag about anything cool happening, uh, that's how we'll end up for the evening. So Jamie, our last online person. Uh, and if you want to share whoever your last online person is something, you want to start out by sharing something great about Tosa Schools, you can start out that way too. Okay, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. All right. Hello, my name is Megan Fox, and I'll tell you why I'm not going to give you my address. For one, I just read your Wisconsin Rules of Open Meetings Act. It's a law. And the law in Wisconsin is, uh, that the public has a right to participate in your meetings and nowhere in it does it say that anyone has to dox themselves online in order to participate in a public meeting. I want you to know that school boards like yourselves have been sued successfully before in the past for doing this. It's considered an intimidation technique. Now, you can sigh and put your face in your hands, but you need to listen to me when I tell you that you can be sued for what you're doing. You are violating people's rights. And, you're do and what you did today, by cutting off public comment in the beginning of the meeting when you had a full house of people who wanted to speak to you, and you made them wait two hours, and most of them had to go home because they had to work jobs tomorrow, or because they had to get kids somewhere, or because they had to go home and get dinner. What you did is violating the public's First Amendment rights to address their public bodies for grievances. It is a violation of the Constitution, and you should each be ashamed. Sharon, you should be ashamed of yourself. Leanne, you should be ashamed of yourself. Michael, you should be ashamed of yourself. And you too, Jenny, and you too, Jessica. And let me tell you something else. When people use names in front yeah, of your school board, and please. they come in and they say, I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about a specific person on the board. You are not allowed to tell them that their First Amendment right to speak is curtailed in some way because they want to use a name. That is illegal. What you are doing is against the, uh, the Wisconsin Open Meetings Act. Now, listen, I have three minutes and I know that I, my time is not up. You are not to interrupt me while I am speaking. This is public comment time and I'm a member of the public. You can sit there and be as uncomfortable as you want, but I have this three minutes. So listen to me, Michael, when you are talking to people, when they come here to see you, you are put into this position, by the way, by the people of this town. They are your first priority. Surprise. <laughs> Where are you? They are your first priority. Just they are the people this. you're responsible you need me to. Mute to. This? Yes. Thank you. Why would you? Why? Okay. Sorry, I couldn't hear you over the. Over no, this. I think at the point where we started attacking individual board members, um, we devolved. Uh, if you've already spoken, um, your time is up on that topic. Anyone? Mr. Martin. Uh, well, two, to two things. First, the chair has a right to cut off comment if the comment is not aligned with the dignity of the body. So um, just to put that out there. So we, if, if there's something inappropriate being said, no, that's a judgment call. That's true. But the chair does have authority to do that. The chair does not have authority under our rules to cut off a board member. We have no time limits. <laughs> so I can just keep talking here once you recognize me. But to say whether you support me or not in the community, we have an orderly process. And the chair is running the meetings and the chair has certain discretions and that's okay. That's probably a good idea. Um, second thing about minutes, we learned years ago to keep the full board minutes to legal, legally required items because it became unwieldy to recap the conversation in the minutes. I think though, with respect to the committees where you're looking for active community participation to work with you, if in your notices of the meeting and in your minutes, you provide some narrative that uh, uh, not to 
discuss the topic in the minutes, but to raise interest in the community when they go, what are these, what are these committees doing? Like, oh, well, they talked about this today, or they talked about that. And, and wow, I think I'd like to go and watch that meeting or you know, there's, I think from a committee perspective, your objectives in the minutes, not legally different, but just paradigm different about what you, and with your notices as well, to generate, you know, those people who have a contribution to make to know, oh, they're going to talk about this particular thing that the legislature is addressing now. I know something about that. So I'm at that meeting I'm going to come to. So I think we could generate more community participant, a theory, right? Who knows what actually happens, but okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, one comment I want to make, there has been uh, quite a few public comments about the human growth and development, many not from Wauwatosa. Um, at this point, that decision has been made. Um, agree or not, the decision's made, we're moving forward. Uh, we won't take this up again for another three years. Um, that's per policy. We're not reconsidering it. We're not, it's off the table. We're moving forward. It's being implemented. Um, at this point, if you're a TOSA parent and you've got concerns and anxieties, I understand. Um, I would say this is a great opportunity to reach out to principals, to reach out to the administrative team, Dr. Marble. Uh, we want to hear those thoughts and concerns. It is really hard as a board member to parse out the real anxieties parents have about any change in the curriculum. And they are valid if you have them. And you should reach out and talk to the school staff uh, and talk through those things. Um, with some of the other comments that we've gotten. Um, so feel free to comment away. You will have that opportunity, at least until a policy may be changed by any three of the policy. I don't know if it'll be the policy committee or I'll throw it to Mr. Phillips and his colleagues, but this is, this is over. Um, so the community had a lot of opportunities for feedback. There were multiple opportunities, uh, beginning a year ago this month is when I first saw the information shared. Uh, seeking community participation. And those continued through January. And it went through that, that body. It went through an internal body. It went through the curriculum community, which also had several parents and community members on it. So if you would like to call and talk with me about it, if you would like to leave screaming voicemails about me being a pedophile about it, you're welcome to do that. You probably won't have much of an impact on my thinking. Uh, if you want to sit down and have coffee and really discuss it, I'd be happy to do that. I think most of the board members would as colleagues, but I would say I'm really interested in what parents and community members in Wauwatosa have to say. Um, I respect other school districts of being able to do whatever you would like and advocate at your school district. Please do that. Democracy is important. At this point, we're moving forward. Okay. Um, anybody want to, Ms. Fraley? I have two quick things. One in response to what Ms. Falk Pellick and Ms. Uh, Alexander shared about Disability um, Awareness Month and our partnerships. Mr. Phillips raised um, a couple weeks ago about how we might write into policy uh, preferencing vendors perhaps that build a relationship with the district. And so I'm just curious if it's possible for us to maybe consider as a board writing a thank you note to the employers within Wauwatosa who work with our transitions programs or any employment program. And I'm happy to like take that on. I just think it's an opportunity for the board to show the employers in the community who work with our um, students with special needs that we appreciate that they are um, taking that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing was you asked for something positive, and I wanted to call out the custodial staff at Tosi East, Mr. Chuin, am I saying his name right? Chuinsky? Yes. And Nick Hughes for dealing with a medical situation this week that um, process was followed, what could have been really bad ended up in a really positive way. So I was very grateful for um, how well they collaborated in a very short period of time. So calling out the good news. Awesome. Anything else from the board or the community that you want to celebrate any good news? Students? All right. Um, 
So uh, our fall sports at East are in their postseason now, and the boys soccer team and the girls volleyball team are both regional champions. Um, the girls volleyball team has a game tomorrow, and the boys soccer team has a game on Thursday. So it'd be awesome to see some people there, um, get a get a very a lot of support for the guys um, and the girls. And I think we can get deep into this uh, run this year. So. Cross country is going to state too. Girls, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's daughter, perhaps. <laughs> Proud parent moment there. Um, if you have. Oh. Um, at West, we just got new MacBooks. I, oh, I like Mac computers in the art room. And so those just got installed today. So we've been able to use them. Fabulous. Exciting vote. Yeah, it's nice that that's happening already. Um, Tosa is a place with phenomenal music, uh, phenomenal arts. Um, and this Saturday, as I was meandering my way past East, I saw I, what I think is the first time was like a kids orchestra music introduction uh, from one to three. So big thank you to the staff who did that. Uh, if you have not experienced Band Blast Off, um, which is a summer school program for kids going, I believe in the fifth grade, uh, who are beginning band, uh, it is a hoot. I have a tuba player in my family and wow, that is a loud instrument. Um, <laughs> so that is really cool. And then we are entering theater season. Um, so each of the middle schools are going to do some great productions, uh, the secondary schools, and then parent-teacher conferences, if they have not started already at the elementary, I believe elementary school are in the midst of them, and then middle school, high school are about to start out. So uh, this is a great opportunity for parents to engage uh, in the schools and make sure that you're doing stuff. Um, so a big thank you to all the teachers working some late nights, getting all those things in. I know we're also doing a lot of extra additional grade engagement. So a lot of stuff about kind of what's in and where things are at, and that was really nice to see. So a lot of things moving forward. So a big thank you. Um, thanks for everybody who came out tonight and participated in democracy. Um, and Dr. Means, anything closing us out? I want to thank and welcome Ms. Julia Summers. I'm the new executive assistant to the superintendent's office. So Ms. Summers has been calling roll. It's been nice to not call it. <laughs> welcome Thank you for Ms. having me. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome to Wisconsin and Wabatosa. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Please call the roll. Ms. Mealfeld? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Jessup Inger? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Have a great night, everybody. All right. We have